In this section, I want to uh, talk a little bit about spinal reflexes. I want to remind you about the basic spinal reflex arc. Then we're going to think a little bit about how um, reflex arcs communicate with one another to coordinate their action before finally considering the supraspinal modulation of spinal reflexes and the clinical importance of this. So let's start off by drawing the simple reflex arc for the patella reflex where we hit the patella uh, ligament and get a reflex extension of the knee joint and as you should recall the the primary spinal cord level for the patella reflex is at the L3 level because it is the L3 myotome that um, is the major input to the quadriceps. We'll draw a cross section through the spinal cord so here's a cross section through the spinal cord and I've left those gaps so that I can add on the dorsal and ventral roots. I'll put the central canal of the spinal cord here. I'll add the dorsal and ventral horns there. And then let's add the dorsal and ventral roots here. So there's the dorsal root with the dorsal root ganglion. And here is the ventral root joining up with the dorsal root to form the spinal nerve. Okay, so far so good. And we'll just do a, a silly little diagram to remind ourselves of the reflex that we're, we're studying. So here's my very um, poorly drawn femur. Here's my even worse drawn tibia there. Here is the um, patella. with the patella ligament just there. And here are the fibers of the quadriceps joining onto the patella, inserting, okay? So we come along, we tap the patella ligament with our tendon hammer, and we stretch the fibers of the quadriceps. And this stretch is detected by muscle spindles, which are present within the uh, quadriceps muscle in itself and I'll just represent those as this little red dot here. Now muscle spindles detect muscle length i.e. they detect muscle stretch so we stretch it when we tap the ligament with the tendon hammer. The information concerning the length of the muscle is carried towards the central nervous system through the spinal nerve this being the L3 spinal nerve and into the dorsal root. And remember that the dorsal root ganglion contains the cell bodies of these first order sensory neurons. This sensory neuron continues in through the dorsal root and actually goes into the dorsal horn but projects all the way down to the ventral horn. Okay, once in the ventral horn, the sensory neuron synapses upon a lower motor neuron. So in green, I'm going to depict the cell body of a lower motor neuron, which is receiving an impulse from this first order sensory neuron concerning muscle stretch. The lower motor neuron sends its axon out through the ventral root into the spinal nerve and ultimately down to the quadriceps muscle itself. This completes the reflex arc, such that muscle stretch results in a reflex involuntary twitch in the quadriceps muscle. So far, so good. Okay, This is the simple familiar reflex arc that we are all happy with. However, the perceptive amongst you um, might realise that there is a slight problem with this. And that problem is that in this schema that we've drawn, we've forgotten about the hamstrings. So the hamstrings, remember, are connecting um, to the tibia and fibula, and they're antagonising the action of the quadriceps. And would it not be the case that this reflex extension of the knee, um, caused by activation of L3 lower motor neurons, would that not in itself stretch the hamstrings, causing the hamstrings to contract? And would not that result in there being no movement at all, because both agonist and antagonist muscles would be contracting? So this is a problem. Thankfully, 
uh, the body knows this knows about this problem only too well, and there are mechanisms in place to prevent this from happening. In order to appreciate that, let's once again draw uh, a cross-section through the spinal cord, but this time at the cord level, which is dominant for innervation of the hamstrings. And that is about the L5 level. Okay, So L5 is our primary uh, myotome, um, which supplies the hamstrings. And once again, we shall draw a cross-section of the spinal cord, just here. Draw the central canal, the dorsal horn, the ventral horn, like that. The dorsal root with the DRG and the ventral root, and then forming the spinal nerve. But this is the L5 cord segment. Now, in the L5 cord segment, just as in the, the just as in the L3 cord segment, we have um, lower motor neuron cell bodies within the ventral horn, which go through the ventral root and the spinal nerve to supply the hamstrings. Furthermore, although I'm not including these for simplicity's sake, we also have um, muscle spindles in the hamstrings which send their information back through the L5 dorsal root, but I'm not including those for the sake of simplicity. Now, when we activate the patella tendon reflex, we send information into the L3 cord segment concerning muscle stretch in the quadriceps, and as we said, this activates the lower motor neurons. But furthermore, what we have is these first order fibers coming from the quadriceps, supplying muscle spindles, also send descending fibers down through the spinal cord. So there are descending fibers going down through the spinal cord and they don't synapse directly upon the lower motor neurons inside this L5 cord segment. In fact, they synapse upon inhibitory interneurons, which I'm going to depict in blue. So these descending projections from the L3 sensory neurons synapse on inhibitory interneurons, which I'm showing here in blue, which go on to inhibit these uh, lower motor neurons supplying the hamstrings. Thus, what we have got here is a system whereby we can activate just the quadriceps and selectively inhibit the hamstrings, resulting in there being no battle between agonist and antagonist muscle groups. Now, this is one of many examples that I could have given you demonstrating how the actions of various spinal reflexes are coordinated. And it's not only restricted just to reflexes on the same side of the body. There are, in fact, a number of reflexes where there are crossed influences, where information can cross the midline, enabling the coordination not only of different levels of the body, but different sides of the body as well. Now, one final thing I want to mention uh, as part of this section, and that is that we must not forget about the role of descending influences on spinal reflexes. So far, we've only really talked about spinal reflexes as occurring in isolation, as occurring entirely autonomously. And that is the definition of a reflex, that, that they occur um, in the absence of supraspinal input. However, inputs descending from the brain have an important modulatory role upon the way that reflexes manifest themselves. So all I'm going to do really, and we're going to think about some specific examples of this in further sections, is just show that there are a whole load of descending influences which are descending down through the spinal cord in various pathways coming from the brain and resulting in the modulation of the activity of these various um, spinal reflexes. So, for example, the Babinski reflex, or the plantar reflex, whereby stimulation of the sole of the foot leads to a flexion of the toes, um, that is the normal response. And that is a response which is being modulated to a certain extent by the presence of these yellow descending modulatory fibres. If a patient has a stroke, these 
uh, modulatory fibres can be damaged and that can result in the reflex manifesting itself in a different way. And in the case of the Babinski reflex, the abnormal response caused by damage to these descending inputs is in fact that the toes extend as opposed to flex. Another example is in babies. Babies, as you might be aware, manifest a number of unusual reflexes which um, tend to disappear uh, once the baby reaches a certain age. And these reflexes um, disappear due to the fact that these descending influences begin to mature within the baby. Okay? So that's all I wanted to talk about with regards to spinal reflexes. Uh, thank you for listening.